as we move forward, um, you know, not just programmatically and philosophically, we are looking ahead to what we can do with this, with this um, site so that our students and our future students will be able to continue that work and identify um, as learners. And the, the smart boards that have been installed, the, the windows, the new flooring and carpeting, the HVAC system, um, the security camera, all those things have really helped um, our, our, our staff, our teachers, our families recognize that yes, this is important. But as we look forward to the new building that is proposed on the field, we're excited. That is, that is so exciting for, for the staff and students um, and the families at Rogers. You saw some of those buildings. You saw the buildings behind multiple layers of chain link fence, which I think is deplorable. We have kids there. Um, you saw the condition of these buildings. Um, and we, we love these kids. We want them to come here. We want them to be able to have the same experience as everyone else. But it's difficult when they are um, in in buildings that exist like the ones that we currently have. So that the new proposal for this structure that we have planned for the, the field, um, it, it's exciting. And it is really rejuvenating for our staff and for our families and for the kids. Um, the Makerspace Labs, for those of you that spend some time outside of what are currently our two kindergarten classrooms. Again, very important. We talk about STEM. We talk about project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, international baccalaureate. When we talk about contexts in which kids can appropriate their learning, spaces like the farm, spaces like STEM, um, STEM labs and major space labs are absolutely instrumental in how students learn. It provides them that real life context, that place where they can come and they can explore the intersection of different disciplines, reading and writing, science, socialism, math. Um, yes, we do that in the classroom, but when there's a dedicated area, a dedicated place on the, on the, on the campus of the farm or the major space labs, gives students that added identity, that added context in which they can actually fundamentally apply what they're learning. We all know from who have some kids, like my own daughter, um, when they have the materials, when they have that space, um, it's limitless what they're able to accomplish. Um, I think I'm forgetting something, Carrie. That's okay, we'll give you a moment later to say things at the end too. Um, and, and, and the outdoor classrooms. My, my, my last thing was the outdoor classrooms. This also was born somewhere. <laughs> it'll be fine. Um, this, this was also born because of the pandemic. When we brought kids back in April last year, full time on campus, our teachers spilled the kids out into the hallways. You see the remnants of it, the vestiges of these tables and chairs sitting in the hallways. It's not the prettiest thing, but because those tables and chairs were there, our kids could come back and they could be here productively and safely. So the idea of being able to open up those beautiful corridors and have the students not only inside the classroom but outside the classroom spaces you know, in, a, in a space that's theirs is, is exciting and it's something that, um, listen, it's Southern California, I'm from New York, um, we can't do this in New York, here we can, and let's, let's have the kids outside and actually have them um, continue to learn in these different spaces. So I think that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you, I, again, I uh, appreciate everyone being here. They'll be around for more later. Um, just to say, so this is our process of what we're going to be doing. Uh, and just a, a list of a few of the things. You, you've seen some of this. This is some of the work that we've done. Security upgrades, the uh, church property, getting that, demoing it, getting it ready. The modernization of the window pane floor project, HVAC furniture, the new furniture that we put in. One of my most excited, one of the projects I'm most excited about because it touches so many kids. Uh, and then our safety security projects. We do still have coming new clock bell PA system, new intrusion alarm. We've got some a little bit more drainage to do. You might see out front that the uh, uh, HVAC thing looks a little ugly on top of this building. We're gonna make that more attractive. Uh, and exterior paint, the plan is to paint the entire campus. Uh, this space gets painted interior uh, and over spring break and the rest of the campus gets painted over the summer. So we have a few more things coming right now, Alexander from Historic Resources Group. Thank you. And you want this? Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alexandra Madsen. I'm a senior architectural historian at Historic Resources Group. Uh, so far, I will go through the process and methodology, the development history of the campus, eligibility and period of significance, findings, uh, just a heads up, we did find a potential historic district, and then next steps. So process and methodology is essentially how we
go towards researching a property and determining if it's significant. Uh, we look at primary and secondary sources, which are, include historic maps, photographs, building plans, building permits, aerial photographs, as well as previous surveys and environmental documents, uh, local histories, newspaper archives, and we also reach out to organizations in the area, including Santa Monica Conservancy. Uh, we then complete a field inspection of the site where we actually go through, look at the buildings, and this informs our integrity analysis to see what materials remain from the original campus and what has been changed out over time. We then develop histories or historic contexts which give us a framework within which we can place this specific school. Uh, so we look through the history of Santa Monica from the very early history colonial and American period. We also look at the history of Santa Monica Malibu School District uh, from its early founding, uh, 1875 to 1902, during the progression, progressive movement when it had unification and expansion, uh, 1903 to 1932, innovation and reform uh, following the Long Beach earthquake, 1933 to 1945, post-war modernism, and then we also look at the development of each individual school, so when it was founded, its architecture, etc. Uh, we also look at the architectural styles, the architects, and the design professionals for each school. So, to move towards Will Rogers, the Lane community, uh, the school was founded uh, following the World War II. The land was actually purchased in the 1930s. Uh, but the campus opened in 1948 with the majority of the buildings that are on campus today. Um, using the cluster plan, so that's these long finger-like uh, buildings. In 1950, Joe M. Mastep, uh, a different architect than Henry Bogarty, who had designed the main campus, uh, also added a few buildings towards the ends. Uh, so those are those little buildings that are sort of set outside of the main house. Uh, in 1970, building B and G uh, were also added and altered by Robert Hyde Thomas. And this is an interesting uh, advertisement actually, for uh, equipment, and it shows the school campus. Uh, so the school was found significant for its population increase following World War II. Uh, there was an increase of over 1,500 students in the school district within a few years. Uh, those students really needed greater classroom size and more amenities uh, as families were moving to this specific area in Santa Monica. Uh, in 1946, the district also received a bond uh, for $3.5 million, uh, so this also helped fund the creation of the school. And uh, within the first year, there were 672 students. Uh, thus, the reason why they needed to expand with some of those later buildings in 1950. Uh, this is an aerial uh, drawing. It's from a Sanborn fire insurance map. And you can actually see the original layout as it was at the time of its completion, uh, which is the same today. Uh, the design and style is what we call the cluster plan. Uh, so that is these clusters of individual buildings sharing central courtyards. Um, it, the buildings were designed in the international style of architecture, so that's the really sort of pared down modernist style. And it was completed by Henry L. Bogarty, who was a very prolific, well-known architect, um, specifically for his work with schools. We found it ultimately eligible for federal, state, and local listing under two different criteria, uh, criteria A and 1, with a period of significance 1948 to 1950. This is reflected towards events. Uh, so those events in this case are the post-World War II institutional development of Santa Monica, also the 1946 bond for development of 3.5 million, and the school also had early WPA involvement. Uh, then criteria C, 3, 4, 5, uh, same period of significance, 1948 to 1950, so that's when the school buildings were completed. Uh, because of architecture, so this is the international style of architecture, its association with a well-known noble architect, Henry Bogarty. Um, cluster plan development, uh, really that central, sort of child-centered school design that we see in a lot of 
access indoor outdoor spaces and cross breeze that's directly in the campus. Uh, these are the list of the buildings that contribute to the historic district. So all of the ones from 1948-1950 were evaluated for integrity, so whether that material was able to uh, still relieve that the way that it looked at the time of its construction. We did an integrity analysis. Um, other site features include the courtyard, so that's the spatial relationship between buildings, the 14th Street squad, and then also the stone planters just at the front. Finally, an additional feature is the Bill Rogers Elementary School sign, which a lot of people mentioned the really like. So this is an overview of that historic district, um, contributing buildings, features, and additional features. Here are some photographs, although you saw it today, so you don't really need these. Uh, some different photographs of the buildings as well as the features. So the next steps are to incorporate, reuse, and rehabilitate in planning efforts, uh, incorporating the Secretary of the Interior Standards, as well as informing future planning, design, and environmental design. So with that, I will go ahead and hand the presentation over to Jim is going to talk about architecture. Yes, yeah, so as advertised, I'll just be speaking about two major topics. One is what the master plan is that uh, the district is proposing for consideration by the Board of Education. And then out of that, the first project that has emerged which is currently funded and which some of you saw some descriptions out on the site. But before I begin, I did want to actually lay bare what it is that an architect has to think about as a plan and design of campuses. There's a whole array of interests that play, some of them in contradiction with one another. Probably the highest priority will be the educational goals that the district wants to achieve in what they call 21st century learning models. All of which have been described in a fairly comprehensive and detailed manner, which I'll mention again. That's probably the highest priority for them on balance. Uh, but we also have to make sure that whatever we do is in harmony with the existing campus fabric, the, the uh, original buildings, the character and identity of it. We have to make sure that we are preserving not just the quantity of campus open space, but the quality of it. So right now, I would say the quality is mediocre. There's tons of it, but the field's not properly located. There's just tons and tons of asphalt. Uh, it's not all about quantity. It's also about how we use it, how it gets integrated into the learning environment, a variety of opportunities for uh, outdoor learning that are uh, accommodated by it. We also have to pay attention to the fact that the community uses these after school hours and on weekends. And therefore, it has to be accessible, it has to be safe, and it has to be abundant for their uses. I wish all of us, faculty, staff, students, parents, and whatnot, could live within walking distance of this campus. If we lived more compactly, we could, but we don't. And it's highly unlikely that we ever will. So we have to accommodate vehicles, whether we like it or not. And we'd rather not do it on city streets. And we'd rather not spend bond funding on underground parking, so we're stuck with it. We have to deal with about three quarters of the acres of this campus are going to be consumed with parking, one way or another. We cannot use the streets, pick up a drop off. Your neighbors are not going to be very happy with that, so we have to accommodate that as well. It's just a given, it's something that we have to balance in the larger equation. Building one-story buildings and the square miles of asphalt required to support them is not a sustainable land use. It may have been true in 1948, but it's no longer true. We have to air condition our building because we paved over the city and created a heat up in the country. So this build, these buildings didn't need air conditioning in 1948. Now they do. It's because of our land use habits. We can't continue to spread out. There's no more land anyway, even if we wanted to. So we also have to keep that in mind. We have to learn to accept that we have to build more compactly as we move into the future. We are not flamethrower type architects. We're not going to put a hand grenade in your lap or land a spacecraft on campus. We're not going to destroy the campus or the neighborhood with any new building that we build. We want to actually accommodate 
the existing character of the, of the campus and the neighborhood in a way that's harmonious without mimicking it, which will only come off as, uh, as faults. And finally, we just have to be really careful with taxpayer dollars. We really have limited dollars to work with, so whatever we do has to be a sound investment that doesn't have to be undone 10 years from now because we didn't plan properly for what may come next. That's fiscal responsibility, so whatever investment, investment we make now actually lasts for a generation or two or a lifetime. And then we have to be careful about how we implement projects so that they have minimum impacts on the operations of the school and that we can do them in a fairly expeditious way that minimizes impacts on both the neighborhood and the school. So this is the existing campus with 14th Street along the bottom, 16th Street along the top. Carrie, I'm wondering if there's a water or something there. You can tell. Yeah, I can get you water. Thank you. I need my keys up there. Uh, and in blue is the, uh, the historic proposed historic district that was just described to you. Uh, the 1948 and 1950 structure. So basically the entire school is, uh, in the opinion of the historic consultant, considered a potential historic uh, resource of, sim of significance. In purple are the portable classrooms and the modular classrooms. There's a total of 11 of them. Six portables and five modular classrooms. So phase one is to uh, build a new early education building up in the um, northeast corner of campus. Uh, it's a one-story structure. It will be the last one-story structure, hopefully, that we ever build on this campus. It'll have four kindergarten classrooms and three TPA classrooms with sequestered play area for kindergarten and transitional kindergarten. Uh, and uh, at that point, we'll be able to remove then six portable classrooms from the campus. So um, almost more than a little more than half the portable and modular campuses will be removed after completion of phase one at which point we'll then be able to move the field away from the neighbors to the north to the center of campus. So another example of how it's not just quantity but quality, we'll be able to integrate that field more into the daily life of the kids so they're not playing out on the North 40 along those two side apartment buildings in an awkward relationship with them. And we will be set up for phase two, which will be to build a second classroom building, in this case two stories with 10 classrooms in it therefore replacing all of the portables and modulars on campus and accommodating other program needs that I'll describe shortly. We will, in order to buffer both the campus and your neighbors to the north, we have installed a parking facility that connects 14th Street and 16th Street along the north side of campus. We will then accommodate on-campus pickup and drop-off in any number of combination of ways. We'll, we'll maximize flexibility for the school to choreograph, pick up a drop off, uh, either from 16th or 14th or both. We'll be able to park early education parents while they're doing pick up a drop off from the other side, et cetera. There are two other projects that will be uh, included in phase two, which are renovations that occur actually within the complex of the school. The first one classrooms up here in front of the campus, transform them into maker spaces. A beautiful outdoor ca uh, classroom in between them, which is shown here. We're standing in one of them, looking out to the outdoor classroom space to the other maker space across the way. The second project will be to take each of the interstitial spaces between the finger buildings and transform them into useful outdoor classroom spaces, which will be configured about half of it will be paved to accommodate tables just outside the classroom. Half of it will be vegetated different kinds of outdoor activities, all learning-oriented uh, activities. <laughs> so in this, view, in this view, we are looking east towards the uh, current playground area, 16th Street beyond, where at the end, there are um, outdoor classrooms that will connect uh, the, the uh, individual uh, room buildings at the end of, of, the, uh, of these interstitial spaces beyond. 
And the final component of phase two is to uh, finally give yourselves a multi-purpose dining facility. You know, of the three schools we're working with, this is the only one that doesn't have an actual separate cafeteria and auditorium. Not to mention this room is undersized anyway. So we'll relieve this room of all its functions in terms of serving meals, providing a meal at uh, meals uh, with a new facility out there associated with the farm. So there will be a kind of farm-to-table program that they'll be able to develop for the children uh, throughout the school year. So all of that is very well described in the education specifications that I mentioned before. It's available and online if you want to take a look at what the possibilities are for that facility later. So as you can see, all of the projects that are in, embedded in the master plan lie outside of the historic district, potential historic district, uh, with the exception of the two uh, renovation projects that I described, the upper classrooms and the kind of spaces. So here's just a 3D overview of what that is. Phase one, one-story early ed kindergarten building field on the right. Phase two, two-story 10 classrooms. Uh, on the north side of campus, the two renovation projects. And finally, uh, this last phase three uh, is the uh, new NPR up there with the uh, learning garden, uh, which you call the farm piece. So you've heard me mention the education specifications. They are the result of an education master plan that the district adopted in 2019. It's a very fancy word for a bunch of room prototypes. That's all it does, it just says, this is how we want to teach, and these are the rooms that we need to do it. And they do, and they have laid out every single room in the campus of the future. In quite a bit of detail, in terms of the sizes, in terms of their adjacencies, the fixtures, furniture, equipment, it's all there. I would note that all of them require adjacent outdoor open space that's contiguous with the classroom itself. So, for example, the classrooms themselves, pre-K, TA, kindergarten, first and second grade, third and fifth grade. You notice the sizes of them, and the interesting exercise to compare them to the sizes of the rooms in the existing building, which, after all, were designed in 1948 for a very different model of education, where it was very regimented, a student was really thought of as a receptacle of information, then regurgitate that information on a test, very different from the model that is embedded in the education master plan, where they want you, ch your children to learn by doing. Self-initiated, group study, project-oriented, uh, activity-based. And you require room for that. So if you compare the sizes of, let's just take first through fourth grade, which are in each of those bar buildings. Those classrooms are about 880 square feet, Master Brian calls for 1,300 square feet for first and third grades and 1,400 square feet for fifth, fourth through sixth grade. You can kind of feel that now if you walk into those classrooms that are really sardine cans. They're filled to the brim now because they've adopted a different way of arranging themselves. <clears throat> so let's just pretend we wanted to fill the ed plan in the existing building, retaining the existing building. That would mean we'd have to take out a bunch of walls and increase the size of the rooms so that we achieve the 1,300 and the 1,400 square feet. That has a few challenges associated with it. One is we're constrained by the width of the classrooms, so we'll get bowling alley type classrooms, very long classrooms. The second is we're going to go from 16 classrooms to nine, so we will have lost seven classrooms in the process. The third challenge is that this building was built in 1948, basically as a big house. It's wood frame construction. It's a bungalow on steroids. Now it's safe, but the DSA regulations changed every five years. That means there have been 16 rounds of regulation increases since this building was built. So as soon as you touch it with an interior renovation like I just described, you will take this building down to the studs, and you will rebuild it with steel frame construction, new foundations, and then put it all back together again. I'm just putting it out there. If this is something you want to do, you can either say, forget the aspect, just keep it the building the way it is, or you really have to take that on it as a project. 
And I guess finally the last thing to reiterate is it was built at a time when everyone thought land was just an endless resource. We would just keep building outward and there's no end in sight. And that's just no longer the case. We can't do that anymore. We can't do that in Santa Monica, that's for sure. So that is why we are thinking about building two-story buildings, why we are engaging in more compact development, and why we have to think about how, even beyond this time frame, we're going to deal with how we're going to accommodate children under this 21st century <coughs> philosophy going forward. <coughs> so I'll briefly describe then phase one. Face of it, it feels like it's oddly located, but there has been quite a bit of thought into how we located that building, which has to do with, as I said, accommodating phase two, and also tying it into the circulation system of the existing complex. So very carefully considered how we would tie in cross circulation to connect to the main campus. This concern came up early with district leadership was the relationship with the neighbors to the north, which as you know, we're setting south because we want to improve that relationship. So if we take a section through that, you see the two-story neighbor on the right, and you see the kindergarten building on the left, and you see the eight-foot wall that will separate the parking structure from the uh, kindergarten playground area, and you see the lines of sight from their bathroom and kitchen windows, and they will be completely concealed. There will be no visual relationship, we will plant trees, there will be no noise issue or security issues. So that is a 70 foot setback. The reasoning behind that is to provide a proper buffer with the neighbors to the north and to accommodate that future parking a lot along the north side of campus. Also, quite a bit of thought has been put into the configuration of the building itself which ultimately landed in two possible options, which is to put all the support spaces between the classrooms, or to put it along the front of the classrooms as another buffer between the main playground areas and the classrooms themselves. It has been brought up then, are we making the building too solid by placing workrooms and bathrooms along the playground area? I'll just point out that we have heard that, and we are maximizing as much as possible the glass area, the openness uh, from this side of the building up to the main playground area, minimizing the amount of support space that we need uh, to support the classrooms. And it should be pointed out that the entire north face of the building is completely glass. It will open up completely to the playground area, and even have vertical retracting doors in each of the classrooms. There is something that we need to be careful about because, as you know, a grammar school classroom, particularly kindergarten and pre-K, requires wall space. If you walk into those classrooms, you see how much they use their wall space. They're even using the glass for wall space. <laughs> so we, there's a limit to how much we can make this a glass box. They do need their wall space for proper uh, learning environment. That said, we are, as I said, opening up the entire north wall of each of the classrooms with the vertically retracting doors that will seamlessly connect their play area <coughs> to the classrooms themselves. So this is a view looking northeast, 16th Street along the upper right, field to the right. This is a view the opposite direction, southwest, field to the left, 16th to the foreground, 14th Street on the upper right. This is a view looking uh, northwest, field in the foreground, 16th to the right, main campus and 14th Street to the left. The view from the field, 16th Street to the right, through the pre-K classrooms to their play area, the, <coughs> excuse me, beyond. From the uh, buildings uh, close to the main campus, looking through kindergarten, from the playground area north of the main school complex, looking east towards the new field up through the right, a little bit closer into a kindergarten classroom. Looking back, you will have, there will be skylights, so there will be south, uh, 
sunlight coming from the south into the classroom as well as from the north looking out to the main playground. So what I've just shown you on the right is how porous this building is. It is not a solid bunker. You will have visual access from the south loggia up to the sky and out to the playground and from the classroom itself up to the sky and out to the playground <coughs> in two directions. The view out to the playground and finally the view from the kindergarten play area <coughs> through the building to the main playground area. Thank you. Our uh, entitlements consultant, and he's going to talk about our California Environmental Quality Act process, or CEQA. Next slide. It's one slide, so we'll be really quick. <laughs> so, good evening, everyone. My name is Julian Capita. So, the next step of what needs to get done is Jim and his team is going to go and. and to work on designing the phase one project uh, in, in more exact details than we have right now. And during that time period, we're going to uh, get our CEQA process started. Um, so our, our historical consultants are going to work with Jim's team to determine if uh, the building of that new building would have any impact on these resources, um, as well as the rest of the master plan. And then our CEQA consultants are going to be doing their technical studies uh, determining if construction would lead to any noise or air quality impacts, especially concerning because students will be on campus during this time, so if necessary, they'll come up with mitigation measures and, and the things they need to make sure that the kids are safe and, and have a safe, secure learning environment while the construction is going on. Uh, they'll also uh, look at things like uh, is there any risk of uh, hazardous materials release, which is unlikely other than it's an asbestos old building. But we have methods for taking care of that. And then other things, uh, like I already said, noise, but uh, would the new lighting impact any of our neighbors? Or, uh, would uh, there be any traffic impacts, things like that? So they're going to be doing all of that and preparing the CEQA documentation. Um, the first step of that would be the preparation of the initial study. And that document really tells us, the, us as well as the public, what the environmental impact reports will study. Uh, the initial study should come out sometime in the early summer, and that will uh, have a 30-day public comment period, uh, which will include a, uh, a meeting, probably be held in this room, to discuss um, the next steps in the CEQA process, which is the preparation of the draft environmental impact report. Uh, we anticipate that that will come out late fall, early winter of, of this year, um, and that has a mandatory 45-day public review period. That will contain um, the project description, all of the findings and potential mitigation measures um, and, and things of that nature. Also during that 45 day review period, there'll be another public meeting where you can comment on the adequacy of the environmental document. Um, and then after we've received comments, both verbal and written, because people can write emails and letters on the, on the environmental document, um, we'll prepare what's called a final EIR. Um, and then any agencies, any public agencies that have commented, they're required to get the, uh, uh, our responses within uh, 10 days prior to board approval, and then board approval, which will occur in, in spring 2023. The board will consider adopting, uh, certifying the EIR, adopting the mitigation monitoring reporting program, and uh, any findings in the state of the condition. So that's, that is the simple process. Great, thank you. Okay, so one of the things you might say, thank you. Uh, so one of the things you might see is that we have a lot of things that are happening simultaneously. And all these sorts of things are all going together. And we have to get the CEQA approved and the designs approved by the Division of State Architects. And we have to hire a contractor and get to, so our first project, our, right now we're aiming towards uh, starting construction next summer, summer of 23. And that building is going to take 15 or 18 months? 16 months. 16 months. So we might not make August of 24, but we'll make soon after that. We're going to try to hit the August of 24 to have that building operational. And then we'll move towards the other items as we uh, get more funding and as we're able to move forward with the other things. One thing I haven't talked about that I think was really important is we're about to experience a dramatic change in elementary schools. And that is transitional kindergarten. 
Right now, if you're if you turn 40 years old between Jan August 1st and December 1st, you're able to go to a year of school called transitional kindergarten. Progressively moving, adding months each year, and by the time we get to 2025, all four-year-olds will be available for universal transitional kindergarten, or TK. So essentially, we're adding a whole new grade to elementary school. So we're actually preparing and trying to make sure we're there. For some places, we had preschool on the campus. In some ways, I think the three-year-olds, which will now be preschool, might be at John Adams or Washington West. But here, all the four-year-olds will be here in transitional kindergarten. And they'll have a specially developed program for them developmentally that will help be specific to what their needs are. And that will lead them into kindergarten, which is very different than TK and then into first grade and as we go through the process. So that's part of what we're preparing for, is also getting ready for transitional kindergarten, which in a funny way is, we only learned about this about six months ago whenever the governor said, hey, guess what, let's add transitional kindergarten. But what was great was a lot of the work we were already doing was preparing us and getting us ready. Ah, we've hmm. talked a lot, we'd like to hear from you. So now is your moment if you want to get up, if you want to say anything to comment. We'll sort of keep you a couple minutes per person, but also if you have some questions, we have all our team here to respond, to answer. Um, and we'll spend the last, you know, 20 minutes we have together to uh, hear from you. In the historic district, the, so we have the finger buildings and the Victorian buildings that are in the historic district. They can be how does that work? Okay, yeah, uh, so, so interesting, the, the idea here is that is we're looking at a historic district, so everything is made because of the collection together, so there's not any specific building that is a historic uh, a resource by itself, but collectively, it's created a historic district. The question then is, what creates that integrity of the historic district, and can some things be altered, changed, removed, to allow for, uh, you know, and still maintain and retain the worst historic district. Certainly the earlier build, and certainly the earlier buildings, the first things that were built, uh, are a little bit more essential because they were primary. The secondary buildings, like the four of the five fingernails were added, they might not be as essential to maintain the historic district. But that's all a discussion that our historians, our historic architects, our CEQA uh, folks will all take a deeper look at. Um, in the plan, we do look at maybe removing four of the five. Um, the problem is whenever I start using words like removal, and then the word, then the symbolism of fingernails and fingers doesn't <laughs> seem to be as nice. Um, but just to give our play area a little bit more room, you know, and a little, and open them up and sort of have that openness out of the, so we have a better flow. It's one of the things we're thinking about. We will look at that as part of our sequel process. It'll be analyzed, it'll be discussed, and we'll see if that's an appropriate thing. It, there is a process. Uh, the State Secretary of Interior has, has established a process. There's a whole process as part of CEQA, so we'll be looking at that deeply to see if that's something we want to do. Um, it's always a potential that for historic, for educational reasons, we're an old educational school, we could take it all down. But we want to find that right balance between our historic and our uh, education. I mean, as, as Jim spoke, you know, some of our historic spaces were really good ideas when they were built educationally, maybe not as much. But we want to find where we can find that balance, and we think that, uh, but in what we foresee doing, what we think we will have funding to do, what we think we can achieve in the next 15 years. We're not really talking about impacting the historic district in a very significant way. That was a long explanation, but I wanted to be able to get the whole picture of historic, which is very interesting. Other comments? Yes? Are there any um, trees on campus considered historic? Uh, we don't have a, we, we have a list of trees. We don't have any trees that are currently like considered historic or part of the historic resource. I know that Santa Monica has now started designating some trees. There are some that we've sort of looked at as legacy trees. Um, we have noted some that we definitely want to try to keep. 
Uh, even though they're challenging in their own wonderful ways, once you get past the 100s, those ficuses, I think we're going to try to keep those with the new building. We're looking at that. That's part of our consideration. But I will say where we have gone in and needed to remove trees, like at Santa Monica High School, as we've remade the whole campus, we've had to do that. We're replacing uh, trees uh, by, you know, over two to one. I mean, it's like we're replacing, we're making sure there are more trees, more green space at the end. Mm -hmm. And even there's, if you actually you see that little corner on um, Pico and uh, 4th Street, you might notice that at the corner of the football field, there's some trees growing there, mm -hmm. because that's what we call our branching out nursery, where the students are actually growing trees from seedlings so that they're ready to be put in place when the buildings are ready. So that instead of putting in four foot, six foot trees, which is, you know, all you can get out of a thing, we're putting in 12 and 14 foot, you know, more mature trees. So that whole idea of preparing and making sure that we are actually being responsible. Hell up to the mic. I'm a teacher here, for those who don't know. And thank you so much for this presentation. And it's absolutely beautiful. And I just want to tell everyone here that, so you know how, bad reviews of a restaurant, everybody finds out about the bad restaurant, but people don't talk about the good restaurant. I feel like everyone here, if you saw this, our school, I can, I can envision the kids in all those spaces. This school is so unique because always being a STEM school since I've been here and now becoming an IB school and just knowing those spaces. So I think it will be really powerful. So for me, I mean, I, you know, wasn't even planning on staying and I was actually riveted by the presentation because I was visualizing our students in those outdoor spaces and the big classrooms and so I just feel like everyone here can go out if you really thought that was beautiful and you can envision this for our kids that's the power of everyone here to go spread the word because there are the arguments again you know with the historical so I learned all about that and so we're hearing a lot of that chatter. And so I think they validated a lot of those um, adversarial you know, comments because you are keeping that in consideration. So I, for one, am gonna be going out and supporting this 100% and I'm really excited. It looks beautiful and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! And I have to say, we so much appreciate our teachers. They, they know, along with the principal, what's really happening here. We try to listen to them and respond, but you know, when we go, this whole thing you're seeing is based on dozens of meetings. Many occurred on Zoom because it was the only way we could do it. Dozens of meetings that developed the concept and the process. Uh, just like the education specifications were developed completely in relationship with the educators. They were telling us what they needed to, to make that work. So we, you know, we're trying to be very responsive to them, but we're also responsive to you. Anyone else, please. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're a little bit, we've dropped a little below 500. We were up to like 550 a couple of years ago. We've dropped just a little below. We think that's going to go up. Also, the um, uh, TK is going to add at, at almost as many as we have in kindergarten. So we're expanding to seven grades here, which is going to add students. We also know that as the city does a lot of the things they're talking about doing with with adding additional um, uh, housing uh, and other things, we see the potential that we're gonna be up a little more. So we're planning more on the 550 to 600 range. Not much more, not, not hundreds more, but just to, the biggest thing is, it's enough to make keep, keep track of, but the biggest thing is just, you know. Right now, yes, there's no plan of changing the district, uh, you know, but. Well, we're going to have to see how things go education I mean, with, with the with the housing and all the you know the, the, the city is uh, and the state is pushing the city to add nine thousand new units in the city over the next ten years, huh? Apartments, houses, anything. It's uh, yeah, places for people to live and 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 we hope that those also keep developing so that we have more students and kids because we want more families because that's really what creates a community. It won't happen fast. We usually see it coming, and we'll need to be planning ahead. Uh, I will say we don't know what's going to happen at the airport. 
So that's, uh, that's so we are looking into the future, and, and, but that's also where we're looking at how we can adapt, and, and we have thoughts and plans of what we can do if we have to, uh, if we need to. But we'll, you know, we're here to educate the kids how, however many we get. <laughs> yes? Just um, where I'm Laura Simon, I'm the STEM teacher here, for those of you who don't know. And I just wanted to say, I was part of the original plans for this a couple of years ago, whenever it started. And then being out at COVID and being back, and we've had all these like ad hoc outdoor spaces, and now I'm pretty much fully teaching outside with STEM, and to see it even back then, it sounded great. Now doing it to have them more like permanently created, instead of it being ad hoc and having the overhangs and having it make more sense and having, I was even talking, they have a different landscaping opportunities to get water thing features out there and all sorts of the possibilities of it would be amazing for our kids. And I think we have such an institutional memory of doing STEM here over time that I think it would be a great transition for us. And even this last experience that's been one of the benefits is it's really gotten us to do more outdoor teaching. And then this would make it just more easier and more flow in and out even better rather than just random desks out there, it would be where they're supposed to be and we would create our classrooms around it. So even today I had to like keep moving things around because I didn't have the proper shading and stuff, so it would be just what it should be. So I think it would be amazing for our school. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. 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 Yes, so the historic buildings, the plan would be that those classrooms would be expanded to some extent in addition to the two-story building being constructed, and that will spread out all the first through the fifth graders in some combination. It's, sort of, it, it, it's a phased idea, is that probably we'll keep them as they are until we get the first and the second building built, and then after, after that, then we'll have enough classrooms that we can expand them, you know, where we can in those buildings, expand them out, you know, make them longer, narrower, but still make a little more space. But we want to also go do the uh, outdoor uh, uh, interstitial areas, the spaces between the figures, uh, sooner because the more we can embrace and create the outdoor space and expand the classrooms even faster than we can get to expanding the interior. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm leaving off Laura here too. I'm an early childhood special education teacher that's here. I'm super excited about everything. I'm really excited about what Laura was kind of talking about, the sort of uh, project-based learning spaces that really let our kids like tinker and move and make. And I have bigger kids, one at the middle school here and one in third grade here now. And I'm so excited for something to happen in between those bigger buildings, at least to make some of that ground more permeable. Because we're environmentalists and we'd like to catch some rocks. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, upgrading the new library and new STEAM building uh, to replace the science building. Uh, some uh, modernization of classrooms in that space. So there's some plans there. And as you know, we've got some big things happening over at Santa Monica High School. So you're in the pathway of what's happening. And uh, by, by the time your kids can move through, we'll hopefully we'll be in a much better place. Um, this seems like kind of a smaller thing in comparison to all these amazing big projects that we're talking about um, and big changes that we're talking about. But specific to the Will Rogers Elementary sign um, that is designated as, a, as its own kind of historic piece to all of this, um, I guess just personally, when we went from the kind of ivory color paint to mention that we're going to do exterior painting again so that's why i wanted to make sure i brought it up um, when we went from that kind of ivory old color to the new new very old at this point but to me <laughs> it was new at some point the yellow and the blue colors um, i was really disappointed to see that they painted over those letters they used to be a metal okay. and um and now it makes it harder to read the sign because it's the same color as the as the paint behind it and it just seemed like it took away from kind of the historic piece of that. So I guess as we're moving forward to the exterior paint, and again, this seems like a small thing, a small drop of, drop in the bucket compared to all these other things, but is there a way to um, maybe restore that to the original metal that it was when it was there before? And again, that kind of just increases the visibility of that sign that's there and the historic piece of, of that, that it's, it doesn't match the, the piece behind it. Okay. 
So, yes and yes. Um, uh, I'm just green lighting that we're only starting now the discussions of doing the full paint job. And what we would want to do, and we would do is, we'll consult with uh, Paul and Alexandro from HRG about what was historic, if we can do anything that brings sort of a restoration to that. But also we'll be talking with Jim about what the right color is and what we can find. So we're gonna look at what historic colors were, what the right color is, see if we can, we, we think we can move away from the yellow, but we still wanna find something that's a much, uh, a very attractive color for the, for the campus. And so, Ryan's going to be very much involved with that, and uh, if you have thoughts about color, hit him first uh, with that thought, because uh, that's something we're really excited about doing this summer. I think we're going to be able to line it up. Uh, we have some other little projects we're doing this summer, and as you see other things you feel like we need to do, maintenance, other things, we, you know, let us know, because sometimes we don't always think of it, and the best ideas always come from you. And it's like we go, oh, well, we can do this. And then we just put it in the queue and we try to get it. And we've been able to move a lot of maintenance projects also along along with our facility improvement projects. Yes? Is that out of the discovery and innovation building at the Sandbox High School? Is that still up on the website? Yes. I've heard anyone to look at what's happened with high school. It is just absolutely yeah, go to the go to uh, our facility improvement site and under Santa, under sites in you know, schools under Santa Monica High School, um, we have we shot a, I think a phenomenal video that goes through. But we also do a little tour with the students through, which is so two different videos, lots of fun pictures, and there's a good presentation of what we're building next, phase three gym, uh, and then if you know because you people are people who show up uh, uh, on. Uh, March 22nd, 22nd, we'll have a special board meeting where we'll be talking about moving into construction and we'll review all these projects we've been doing and the next projects at Samuel High, the phase three project, we'll give one more presentation to the board on that. So, you know, if you want to, hmm? we don't have one yet, but uh, you know, I can say this is any time like your PTA group wants to do a tour of Samuel High, call me and I'll take you on a tour. You know, we can walk you through the whole thing, we'll talk about the whole thing, just, it's just helpful if we get in a group somehow. You have to work with Oh yeah, you wanna see what's going on, because you're gonna get there. And if you haven't taken, you know, we, we did the thing at, at Jams, but if you wanna take a tour and see the auditorium or all the new spaces, what we're planning, hey, we want to show you, we wanna show the community what we're doing, we wanna discuss it. Any opportunity we can have to have to, to have you experience it and talk about it and give us your input, we need it. it it's what's it's what's really important and it's what's exciting. I think it's the most it's more, it's most exciting. I, mean, I, I do enough Zoom meetings. Let's let's take you on tour. And if you're excited, we all need to support. Yeah. Because some of these are funded, not all. So if you're excited, we need to make We need to help support funding. So. With very well yeah. <laughs> At some point soon, we, you know, possibly this year, probably not, probably in two years, we will probably come back with a request for another uh, general obligation, which is a vote by the voters to fund this work. You were very, all very generous in uh, 2018 uh, to pass measure SMS. And the, the new building out here, the finishing of the air conditioning projects, the finishing of a lot of the modernization projects, the new building we're building in Sample High, all of those have come out of measure estimates. And, but the next phase, like, you know, if we go then here after we finish this new building, the next phase is here. Those would be part of an, an additional element. Yep, that's when the time comes. We'll, we'll have measure something, something. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. You can do it. Yes, you can help us push it. Thank you. Um, we are coming to an end. Anyone else have a final thing they really want to say before we close? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> We, 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 we add a lot of things. We're not quite too we likes to turn off everything, for sure. <laughs> All that weirds me out a little bit. Um, uh -huh. 
you know, we're trying to prepare our students. So, so you know, we, we did a lot of technology early on uh, in the measure, in, uh, measure ES and Measure SMS. And, you know, we're already talking with uh, uh, Bertha Roman, who's our IT director and, you know, uh, you know, who sort of plans an educational technology. We're talking about where we go next. Um, and it's, I don't know, I think, I, you know, uh, 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 I just came from a conference and they're talking about suddenly everything going to the metaverse and I'm going, okay, I'm not quite ready for that. Um, and I'm not sure that's the best idea for students because there's something that's learned when we are together. And there's something that is gained. And no matter how much the technology is grand and even becomes even greater, we've learned from uh, the last couple years we can go some distance with the Zoom, but there's so much more that happens, particularly the younger kids, but so much more that happens when we're in the same room together, and when learning happens, and so much more about the collaboration, and where education is changing so much is from, we're going so much away from the teacher-driven education to the student-driven education. And so the students, it's they're learning from each other and collaborating and creating and problem solving together that helps them to find their way to learn. And the teachers are doing their best to create the conditions and situations that allows that learning to work. And that's work. And that's what all this is for.